Okay. Okay. All right. So um, today I will introduce you briefly to Iri Garay. Um, there's not as much to say as with other philosophers, so we might finish early, which would be nice for all of us. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to start with just a little bit. I'm going to put in the chat the outline. So. I'm going to start with her life. There's not much really about her life, but then I'm going to talk about postmodernism, which is the movement she's a part of, postmodernism. And then we'll talk about uh, feminism. Okay, so that's the plan for today. Okay, so for her life, honestly, there's really, I hunted down some information. I could barely find anything. Um, <laughs> so all I know right now is that um, she was born in uh, 1932. Um, let's see, hold on, I just saw that Diaz manifested himself. Okay, yeah, so she was born in 1932 in Belgium. Um, but to be honest, uh, she must be originally Italian because of her first name, Luce. So I, I have to look into that, but she has written in Italian. She, she, she seems to have a background uh, in Italy, but she was born in Belgium. Uh, she then went on for a master's degree in philosophy in Belgium still. Then she moved to France in the 60s. Now this is important because at the time there was a huge upheaval in France uh, around the 60s. So uh, we're going to talk about that. This is the beginning of postmodernism. This is the, the shift from modernism to postmodernism and she's part of that shift. So we'll have to talk about that. She, she gets a master's degree in France in psychology. Um, and then eventually she gets a degree in psychopathology, goes on to work uh, as a, in research. Um, in, in 68, she gets a doctorate in linguistics, and then she begins teaching in France at the university. Um, and honestly, that's all. <laughs> I wish I could have some juicy details about her because she is going to be the one who talks the most about uh, love um, between men and women. So I wish I had some details. I have, I have glimpses of her life. I, I have a feeling she had an Italian lover for a long time, but I'm not sure because <laughs> she alludes to this person. Um, so I, I would love the scoop on Irigara. If you can find anything, I'll give you extra credit. Uh, <laughs> if you can find anything more about what I said about her personal life, including about her love life, I would like to know. Uh, very good. So that's all I have. She's still alive. She must be in her 90s um, right now. Uh, and um, yeah, that's, that's all I got for Irigara. So, uh, and again, right, extra credit for whoever finds me some juicy details about her love life, if you can. <laughs> How much extra credit? Oh, we'll see. Depends on the juiciness of <laughs> what you find. <laughs> all right. It's really a scoop, then I might be very generous. <laughs> all right, good luck. <laughs> okay. So let's talk a little bit about the shift from modernism to postmodernism, because this is really um, where she is. And in order to understand her contribution, we have to understand again the, the movement of which she's a part. So, um, uh, so okay. So let's remind ourselves what is modernism, right? Modernism we studied with Kant, right? So we have an idea a little bit how the moderns are thinking. Um, but what we didn't talk about with Kant, and I'm going to add to what we saw with Kant, uh, is that obviously with Kant we all that, that everything stems from a reason, right? Kant is, this is typical of modernity, right? Reason is the new, um, uh, this is the new dimension that we are exploring. Uh, this is our path forward, right? Away from medieval obscurantism. We are now awakening to human reason, to the fact that we can think, we can solve problems. We can also, we saw with Kant, resolve, um, we can also progress morally thanks to the use of our reason, according to Kant, right? So remember, modernity is the progress, uh, is the idea of progress based on the advances of science, right? We realize that with reason applied to <clears throat> science, we can resolve a lot of our problems. Now, remember with Kant, with moral philosophers, we, the, the idea was... Um, uh, uh, suggested that we could also progress morally through the use of our reason, right? So we all have this reason that is in a way uh, a light 
uh, this is they call the light of reason. This is a part of us which can move us forward. Which which um, so with Kant we have this emphasis on reason, and this is what I didn't say at the time. One of the other contributions of modernism is to say that everyone shares in reason. In other words, we are now moving away from this ancient view that certain races were inferior. I say ancient, even though it still exists, <laughs> because that's when it started, right? So there was a view, if you read medieval literature, there was a strong sense that one's race was superior to other races, that there were inequalities of intelligence and so forth. So with modernity, this is one of the contributions of modernity. There is the idea, or the idea is, is emphasized that we are all equal when it comes to reason. We all have been given the same reason, right? So make sure you write this down, that during modernity, there is an emphasis on what unites us, what we share as human beings, how, what makes us equal. And one of the things that make us equal, according to the moderns, Right? Obviously, it's not wealth, it's not physical strength, it's not going to be, you know, beauty <laughs> right? or, uh, or intelligence, but reason we all have, right? And we can all, we all share in this faculty of reason, right? So, so this was one of the arguments that, that was used um, during modernity to, um, to justify the emancipation of slaves, for example, right? They said, well, you know, if we all have reason, then there's no, um, it cannot be argued that we can enslave each other because we are all equal in that degree, right? So this was really, so, so, so not only are we equal according to the moderns, but we should fight for equality. And this was the other contribution of modernity, right? Uh, it's during modernity, right? This is 18th, 19th century, that people started to fight for the emancipation of slaves, right? And um, uh, or, yes, I will explain myself just a second, right? So, so modernity is, 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 there are two things happening in modernity, right? So to, to explain to Russell. First, modernity is the discovery of um, the human capacity to reason and with this reason to solve our problems, right? So this is um, modernity. That's why modernity is moving away from religion. We saw this with Kant, right? And it's moving towards progress because of this trust and this faith in reason. Right, so that's what we saw with Kant. But now I'm adding, right, another feature of modernity is that we all have reason, therefore we're all equal, right? That's the second point that I didn't talk about before, right? We all have reason, we all have this light of reason, every human being, no matter what religion or ethnicity or race, we all share in this uh, faculty of reason. That means that we're all equal, according to the moderns, right? So now if we're equal, then we need to fight for equality because clearly some people are still being enslaved and oppressed um, with the false concept that they are inferior, right? The moderns, a lot of philosophers during the modern era fought against slavery because they said, we, we do not believe that people are inferior to each other, right? Because we all have reason, <clears throat> we all have this um, human faculty. So a lot of philosophers are fighting against slavery and some philosophers are even fighting for the emancipation of women right they're also arguing that well woman too has reason <laughs> which is new at the time right at the time people didn't believe women had much reason they were more you know emotional <laughs> their brains were empty so so it's really an interesting time right to a certain degree uh, in the sense that uh, equality is the main value of modernity right now, there are some problems with that. Can anybody foresee some problems with this idea that we are all the same and we are all sharing in the same faculty? Anybody sensing some issues with that view? So, like, would love and marriage would probably come into play because one with the whole, like, taking of name, like, taking of last name and also, like, who should be doing what in terms of, like, gender roles and stuff like that? So yeah, yeah, with modernity, you have the dissolution of gender roles because if everybody's equal, then well, why should I do this? <laughs> and why should you do that? Since we have equal mind, I should be doing the business too and you should be helping out with the chores, right? So yes, modernity is the beginning of our problems in terms of uh, domestic, um, the domestic life, right? Absolutely. Uh, there's some other problem, however, more specifically connected to the fact that we are all equal. Is anybody uncomfortable with the fact that we are all equal because we share in the same 
reason. Is anyone sensing the issue with that? Religion? I guess, yeah, culturally. I mean, are we really all the same? I mean, there's, there has to be distinctions in cultures and the way things are approached. Are they looking at this from the Western world? <laughs> from the wor Western point of view? Yeah, you're on the right track, right? Absolutely. This idea that we are only equal because we are the same, but what defines the, what unites us? It's still the West, right? That says, well, what unites us is reason. And of course, a Western concept of reason. And we all have it somewhat, <laughs> right? So, so the issue is that there's two issues. Issue number one, we're equal because we are the same. So what if we're not the same? Does that make us unequal? Is there a problem <laughs> if I'm different, right? So number one, right, equality based on sameness is a problem. And number two, who defines the sameness, right? Right, up until now, even in the works of the moderns, right? It is the, the Western philosophers who define what is human nature, right? Oh, we all have reason and reason looks like this and this is what reason is. And, and, and now everybody has to conform to this, human nature that the West has invented, right? So you see the two problems, right? Let me say it again. Number one problem is equality based on sameness. In other words, if you don't fit in the mold, are you still equal? Are you still a member of the human society? And number two, which is what Rodriguez was saying, who defines the sameness? Who defines human nature? Who is the one doing the defining, right? And, and here in the context of modernity, it's the West which is saying that all humans are equal because we all have reason. And then the way they describe reason is very Western, is very male also, right? So you have some issues there, right? And let me give you an example of today in France. I'm trying to see if I can unpinpoint. I have myself pinned and so I can't hear you guys when you guys are talking. Okay, <laughs> all right. So let me give you an example in France, right, of the, of, of the problems that modernity run into, of the problems that this concept of equality based on sameness runs into. Now, France is, has for centuries, or decades, let's say rather, right, uh, based its citizenship on assimilation, right? If you want to be French, you have to leave behind your culture and your religion and you have to, and then of course you can be full-fledged French citizen. You're going to be equal, no problem, but don't come around bringing your culture, right? If you're gonna be French, you have to be French culturally. So you have to give up part of your religion, part of your ethnicity, if you really want to be a full-fledged citizen. For example, in France, many Jews and Arabs actually change their first name. Right. So I, I once had a funny moment where I, I was calling a very a renowned Jewish scholar and I, I had found his uh, his workplace and I wanted to get in touch with him. And his name was Shmuel uh, Trigano Shmuel, which is Hebrew for Samuel. Right. So he had uh, that was his name that I saw when he wrote books. He had he would sign his books Shmuel Trigano. Okay, So I called the university and I'm like, oh, yes, I would like to speak with Shmuel Trigano. And they're like, who? <laughs> and I'm like, Shmuel, Shmuel Trigano. And they're like, what? Who? We don't have, we don't, oh, we have an Eve Trigano. Eve, which is, I'll write down the name for you because you don't know, it's a very classic French name, right? So the guy went from Shmuel, I'm writing it down, oh, I'm writing to Russell, sorry guys. Um, <laughs> back to everyone, right? The name went from Shmuel to Eve, which is a very French name. And I was, I was shocked at the time, right? That he would change his name in order to be able to be recognized right as a french intellectual right and, and many of my friends would do that they would change their names some of my friends coming from north africa would change their names and they would change their accent <laughs> so uh, one day i would hear them speaking you know with their kind of their normal north african accent and then another time i would hear them speaking with a perfect french <laughs> And I'm like, what are you doing? Why you talk like that? Right? So, so there's really a pressure to conform. Um, and if you don't conform, you will run into problems. And, and today we have in France this huge debate about uh, Muslim women wanting to wear the, what do you call it, when it covers the whole body, including the face. Uh, anybody have the, the word in English? Um, the burqa, you say, you say burqa. How do you pronounce that in English? Because I'm doing it in French right now. Burqa. Say it again. The burqa. Burqa, thank you. Okay. So yes, yeah, so there are many, of course, you're, you're aware that in France, we have a huge Muslim population, right? And a lot of the women are very religious and they want to wear the burqa. 
Uh, now here, even in Queens College, you have people going around like this, right? You, we, you have classmates who wear the burqa and nobody's saying anything. But in France, it's illegal. <laughs> you can be fined if you wear a burqa. The police will arrest you and fine you if you're walking around with that on your face, right? And so it's, it's, it's one of the symptoms of, of how extreme modernism took its idea that in order to be equal, we have to be the same right so let's leave behind our differences that way we'll have peace but such a peace it's a false peace it's a peace based on the shutting down of dissent the shutting down of difference the shutting down of otherness right so the the, the french society uh there which is very, very essentially modernist society, there are huge issues with regards to diversity, with regards to difference, to otherness, right? There is no room for that in the modernist context, right? You have to be the same, then you can be equal, <laughs> right? Then you have rights, okay? So, so these are some- Professor, don't yeah. you think, I, just because I wanted to say, don't you think that those are the same pitfalls with feminism that, women that roles have been defined male roles and women have been trying to fit into male roles instead of embracing us as women <laughs> very good um I, I'm, I'm happy you asked this when, when we uh, go into the section on feminism i'm going to talk about this i'm going to talk about the first wave where women want to fit into male roles and then the second wave of feminism where women are realizing we, we don't have to be male here to be equal, <laughs> right? So we'll talk about that, right? We're going to talk about that in a second. Um, okay, so let's, um, so postmodernism therefore is going to be the backlash, right? And, it, and it, will, it will be a result of all of the problems I just mentioned, right? The, the assimilation, the, the, the pressure to assimilate, the obliteration of difference, the fact that, you know, um, we don't want to hear about your difference, right? So, of course, the backlash came in the 60s, right? And postmodernity is really this um, criticism against modernism and, and this, this, this kind of emphasis this time on our differences, right? This is one of the main contributions of postmodernity. Postmodernity has a lot of issues, right? One of which is relativism, that there is no truth, that, <laughs> that anything goes, that everything is perspective. There's huge moral issues with that, right? But one of the contributions of postmodernity is really to emphasize our differences and to celebrate our differences, right? This is the main reaction against modernity, is to say, no, we have differences, and these must be not only protected, but celebrated, right? These contribute to the progress of humanity. We don't have to all fit in the same mold. We can be different and we can together, right? Work together in our differences for progress, right? Progress doesn't mean just one path. This was the problem of modernity, right? They said, ah, human reason, read in parentheses, Western reason, right? Will lead us into progress. But there are other ways of thinking, there are other ways of doing things that can also lead to progress, right? That aren't necessarily rational, right? So postmodernism is really this kind of swelling of, or explosion of the difference um, of, uh, in, in the face of this kind of pressure to assimilate. And, and so postmodernism is, by the way, both a political and a philosophical movement. Um, can anyone give me the political branch of postmodernism? Uh, and this is happening all over the world, right? You're having this in North Africa, in India, in the United States. What is happening in the 60s, which is exactly what I mentioned here with postmodernity, uh, that uh, what type of celebration of difference are we experiencing in the 60s and the 50s in North Africa, in Latin America, in, in the United States? Can anyone give me the political branch of postmodernity? See if you know your history from the 50s. What happened in North Africa in the 50s? Algeria, Morocco, India also. Uh, where else? Um, 
Those I are mean, are you fighting it's a, against imperialism? Like you're yes, you're very good, right? You have the fight against colonialism. Now, what is colonialism? Some of you don't know, I will tell you. <laughs> the colonial spirit is the idea that the colonial power is there to bring civilization. And so if you want to be civilized, you have to assimilate the colonial language, the colonial infrastructure, the colonial uh, law, legal framework, and so forth, right? So many countries, and my, the example I know best is Algeria, right? If you wanted to be civilized, you had to speak French, you had to go to French schools, uh, and, and if you spoke Arabic, you were a stupid idiot, right? So, um, and there was this notion, there was this idea, right, that the Arab world was inferior, and you had to learn French, right? So if you wanted to get ahead in society, you better go to good French schools, right? So when the Algerian independence movement happened, it was extremely violent, not only because you know, they wanted freedom politically, but they wanted freedom culturally, right? For being so long told that you are inferior because you speak Arabic and so forth, and France is the liberator, you accumulate, right, the resentment. And so that's, so a lot of these, um, fights against colonization had to do with reclaiming one's difference, reclaiming one's voice, reclaiming one's culture, right? Um, and so that's, that's the idea. So one of the people who did this so well, um, I'm going to write him down just so you have an idea. He's one of my favorite authors, Leopold Senghor. He was uh, the first president of Senegal. Right, let me write the name down. So this is a, a Western African country which became independent from France. And he, he was such a genius. Um, he was somebody who not only wanted political independence, he wanted intellectual independence, right? He wanted to formulate, he wanted to, to um, unearth the African psyche that had been repressed by the colonial mindset, right? This was one of his, um, main contributions is to recover what does it mean to be African? What does it mean to think like an African, to feel like an African, and, and, and to still have something to contribute, right, as an African and not as a colonized African, right? So for so long, right, African countries were told by the French colonial power, you know, you, your religion is primitive, it's, you know, maybe demonic, probably, right? It's, it's all, you know, you need to get rid of that, you need to enter the path of civilization, your language is, is, you know, also very mediocre, you need to learn French, it's more sophisticated. So one of his um, contributions was to really reclaim the African psyche, the African genius, the African way of thinking, way of doing, and he called this, this whole, um, movement, uh, negritude. Uh, so negritude from the word, of course, uh, French word neg, which means black, right? In, same as in English. Uh, why am I always writing to myself? Okay, hold on. <laughs> okay, negritude. Negritude is simply an exploration of what it means to be black, right? What does it mean to think like an African, to feel like an African, to live and dwell in one's body like an African, right? This was what he sought to, to discover in order to reclaim um, the essence, right, of African uh, thought, African emotion. Uh, he wrote poetry in his language, right? So you see here, especially in this context, uh, an effort to reclaim one's voice, right? So throughout the world, you have this, right? You have in, in, in India, you have Gandhi, right, doing something similar, trying to build a political system based on Hindu values, right, not on the British system. So he's going to really try to Indianize India, right? India had become British. So Gandhi's efforts is to really draw from the ancient Hindu culture narrative in order to rebuild an Indian identity and to, to base its political system on its own values, right? So you have this, now in the United States, who's the one leading in the United States in terms of reclaiming one's voice? You should know this. I mean, you have several, right? You have 
Martin Luther King, Malcolm X. Very good. Uh, you had, right, you had Malcolm X. You had also Black nationalism, the Black Panther Party, which was very much uh, seen as a threat by the government, but actually one of its purposes was to reclaim Black identity, right? To, to find, to recover the African roots of Black identity, right? You had um, uh, Martin Luther King, of course, who is trying to, he's a little more general and universal in his approach, but still is the idea to give a voice to the voiceless, right? So, so you see how throughout the world, postmodernity is also a political movement. It's also a way to regain, um, to, 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 in a way to, uh, to recover, to rediscover the repressed and silenced voices of different populations, right? Now, um, Irigara is going to be part of this movement, but she's going to be a voice for the women, right? So she's going to be one of the main uh, feminist voices during the 1960s, right? So 1960s, is, uh, although it starts Feminism really starts in the 30s with the vote or in the 20s or even before, we'll see a few texts from before, but it's in the 60s that really uh, you have um, prolific writing on what it means to be a woman, what it means to think and feel like a woman, what is our specific contribution, right? This is very postmodern. Right, and this is part of what we'll see is the second wave of feminism. But this is really a reclaiming of the essence of womanhood. What does it mean to be a woman? How am I different from the man? And how do I still have something to contribute, right, to the progress of society? So we'll talk about that. So, so, but I just wanted to, you to situate her in the context of postmodernism, which is a celebration of difference and a voice for the voiceless. Right? Okay. Now let's go, any questions before I go into uh, feminism and go over the different stages? Okay, so feminism, there are uh, three main waves. So first wave, second wave, and third wave. And then there's, um, I'll talk briefly about this, uh, something uh, more recent called womanism, which we'll talk, we can talk about briefly. Um, but let's go into these three waves of feminism so you have an idea of where Irigaray belongs exactly, right? Okay, first wave starts already in the 18th century, right? This is the striving for equality, right? In other words, woman has to prove that she's like the man, that she's not different. Because the problem was that for, for centuries, the differences had been used, right, to prove that woman is inferior. Um, did we talk about Aristotle? It's so much fun to talk about Aristotle uh, on this point. Did we? Somebody? <laughs> no. No? Okay. Let me, so let me talk briefly about Aristotle because he really is the, 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 the founding father of, <laughs> of the oppression of women. <laughs> so based on our differences, right? So this is a lot of fun. I discovered these texts by Aristotle last summer and I, I found them really interesting. <laughs> Um, because I have a sense of humor, <laughs> kind of black sense of humor. Um, so uh, uh, Aristotle says the following, and the reason I'm going to quote Aristotle now is because everybody has followed Aristotle until these women started to write and, and protest, right? But this was common. The Aristotelian view, you find it in medieval texts, you find it in, in 18th century texts. It, it, it hasn't been renewed until the women started to protest, right? So the main idea is this, according to Aristotle. He base, so he's a scientist, right? He also, not only a philosopher. So he bases his argument on the inferiority of women on the differences in body temperature. So, and this is, this is attested, it's true. Males have a higher body temperature and females have a lower body temperature, right? Now, uh, so, so this is true. But then he begins to interpret and build on that in a way which is very um, demeaning <laughs> to, uh, to, to, to women. So let me explain. So he says, okay, because men have more energy, right, than the woman, and it's true, right, men have more body temperature, meaning they're more energetic than the woman. So he says, because of this, the males are actually better at self-control, right? In other words, if there is a vice or a temptation, right? Something immoral, because they're energetically superior to the woman, they have more uh, fire in their bodies, they have more strength to resist, 
temptation. Whereas the woman, because she has lower body temperature, she easily succumbs, <laughs> right? She, she, she can't really resist when there is temptation. So he does admit that they both know what is right and wrong equally, right? That we both have the same reason, going back to Kant, right? So they both know what's right and wrong, but the woman has a harder time resisting because of her lower body temperature. <laughs> and so she easily flows, right? Or she's too passive or she's too weak to, to resist, right? Uh, another thing that he says is that because the male has a stronger energy, he's born to lead. And the woman, of course, because she's kind of more slow and sluggish, she's born to follow. <laughs> so the male has to have leadership positions and the woman has to have subservient positions, right? Because it is in the nature, according to Aristotle. And so you can recognize these two arguments about the woman being morally weaker and the woman being more naturally submissive. You see this throughout the literature until the women start to protest in the 18th century. You see this in medieval literature, in the best authors, you see this, right? Uh, Kant, uh, even Nietzsche. Who did we study? Uh, I don't know about Rumi, but certainly, did we do, what class is this? Oh yeah, uh, certainly we saw with Plato, the issue of women, right? So you, you have this, so, so this, this is still there until the 18th century. And there you have, so this is first wave, right? This is the protest against this. This is women saying, no, we are not different, right? This is the idea that women believed at the time that if they can prove that they are the same, they won't be treated. They won't, you can't find anything inferior anymore because what Aristotle did was to show they're different, therefore inferior. So first wave is gonna say we're the same, therefore equal. You see the argument? Let me say it again. Aristotle says women are different from men, therefore they are inferior. And so that the strategy of first wave feminism, which we'll see is problematic, but we can understand it at least. Strategy of first wave feminism is to say, well, let's, let's argue that we're the same, that way we'll be equal. And so a lot of women are going to say, well, we think like the males, we are we have everything like the males, we feel like the males, and so we are exactly the same thing, and therefore, why are we being denied equality? One of the people who, who said this the best was uh, Wollstonecraft, Mary Wollstonecraft. Let me write her name. So you guys can um, look these people up if you want to go further, uh, and she wrote something called The Vindication of the Rights of Women, Vindication of the Rights of Women. And so she's one of the first ones in first wave feminism who, uh, and in her book, she really argues that women think, have the same mind, the same rationality as the man, and therefore are equal, right? So that's one of the ones in the first wave, right? Um, also in first wave is Simone de Beauvoir, um, who wrote The Second Sex, right? Uh, I, I put her in the first wave because <laughs> Simone de Beauvoir, to be honest, is hard to read if you're a woman um, because, so I, if you read The Second Sex, right, it's hard to read because it is basically a lament of how horrible it is to be a woman <laughs> in a male-dominated world, right? And she is really, home, I mean, it's just, I, I was reading the book and I was feeling claustrophobic. And I had to like stop reading because I was choking, right? She really makes you hate <laughs> yourself. <laughs> so I had to stop after a while because I was, you know, developing uh, <laughs> some problems. But um, the idea in her book, which is really true to a certain degree, right? She says, she says, and remember, by the way, you have to know her history to know why she talks like that. She's the companion, right? The romantic partner of, of Sartre, right? Who is one of the main intellectuals in Paris at the time. He's writing, he's teaching, he's, he's charismatic. He's, he's just, he's the bomb. He's the one, right? He's the man in Paris at the time. And she's his companion, right? She's his um, romantic partner or lover. And she realizes that he has such an ease because he is male and she feels so trapped in her own body, unable to be as free as he is, right? Sartre is, is the one who developed the idea that you can be whoever you want to be, right? This is one of the main ideas in his um, uh, philosophy that you choose your destiny, you choose your identity, 
you choose who you want to be. And she, she, she wants to do that, but she realizes that as a woman, she's very much trapped in a body, which is in a way impeding many of the freedoms she wants to have. Freedom from having children, freedom from getting pregnant, freedom from you know, the monthly curse, as some of you call it, freedom from all of the ailments that come with being a woman. <laughs> Freedom from sexism, freedom from, you know, feeling insecure in the street. And she realizes, I can't make my own destiny. I am trapped, right? I can't be like my beloved who seems to be floating around in a world that he has constructed for himself. Me, I'm trapped. I'm trapped in my body and I'm trapped in people's perception of my body right? I can never be fully free. And this is still first wave, right? Still, still longing to be a man, <laughs> right? This is what you sense throughout the work of Simone de Beauvoir is this big sigh. Why wasn't I born a man, <laughs> right? Um, so, so this is uh, two, two main authors in, in first wave. Um, and of course, second wave feminism is going to um, uh, react to this, right? And, and and so second wave is in essence the following, is this idea, and this is what Rodriguez was saying earlier, do I really have to be a man in order to be equal, in order to be given justice and equality, right? So many women are becoming aware that, well, I, you know, I've tried fitting into a man's body, but it doesn't work. <laughs> and so many women started to recognize that we are sacrificing our femininity in order to fit into this male um, constructed world, right? Uh, and, and why should we? Why can't we not enter the world as women and still be given a voice and a place at the table, right? So, so many women are now emphasizing the difference between the two genders. And they're saying, well, woman is different, but doesn't mean she's unequal. She's different and therefore capable of adding to the t uh, adding to the progress, adding a different perspective uh, so that we can progress even faster, right? So make sure you write down that second wave is, is different from first wave in that women want to reclaim their difference. They believe that they, they can still be equal and different, right? And that in fact, their difference doesn't demean them, doesn't impede them, but enriches not only them, but the men around them, right? They realize that their difference is a plus, it's an asset. It can bring something uh, more to the table, right? So this is second wave where women start to celebrate sexual difference, right? And you have people like Irigaray, which we're going to see. You also have um, Somebody, uh, this is, I think, on the American side, um, Carol Gilligan. She writes more in psychology, but um, what did she write? Oh, yeah, in, in a different voice. Right, this is a very interesting book. Um, so she start, she's coming more from the psychology uh, uh, platform. <laughs> And she's saying, in essence, that women and men make moral choices differently. So she has actually done some clinical work where she's observing girls and observing boys, how they make a moral decision. So she puts them in a moral dilemma and she analyzes how they, get, how they make their choices. And she started to notice that the boys made choices in a certain way and the girls made choices in a different way. And so she started to realize that women have a different approach to morality. They have a different moral perception. They have a different moral sensitivity. So she's highlighting the difference, right? Between the, the male and the female, which puts her in the second wave, right? We'll see with Irigaray, I'll talk more about her in a second, but we'll see with her that she's going to emphasize, right, the, um, the importance of the feminine voice. Um, uh, it, it, which, if, according to her, must be heard if we're going to build civilization, right? In other words, for Irigaray, as long as civilization is built only by man, yes, we'll get to a certain level, but we will, we will only get halfway there, right? The whole other halfway, we need the woman's perspective, right? And she really encourages, you know, the, 
the inclusion of women in all fields, if we're going to really progress as a humanity, she believes that the woman's perspective, which is different from the male perspective, which complements the male perspective, is needed if we're going to progress. So for example, in the realm of medicine, there must be more women in philosophy there must be more women in theology there must be more women uh, and until we have an equal in government right until we have an equal number we are always going to be limping along right um so uh and this is to a very great degree true right that often when you bring women into these fields they transform, they add, they, they nuance, uh, and, and bring something specific, right, to the table. Um, uh, I mean, there are many examples of this, which uh, I don't know if I have time to get into. I think I do. Um, I'm thinking, for example, of, um, yeah, um, <laughs> unless you have examples of um, uh, how the inclusion of women has enriched the, uh, the field that they they were added to. Nobody has examples. <laughs> well, you could say that because um women being included as well, it allows for different perspectives. Like you said earlier, that um women make different moral choices, make different decisions. So when you consider that along with you know male like view as well, it's sort of like the inclusion of both of them and gives you know that um similar to in the first and how we talked about um that the their bible wanted like the view of different people so with both men and women now included they could both you know come together to figure out the solutions of different things by giving each other you know the different solutions on their end right absolutely right you have um uh, for example, um, just to give a few examples of, of women in leadership positions, you have the um, a German Chancellor, right, Angela, Angela, Angelica, Angela Merkel, right? <laughs> Forgot her first name. Um, so she's the one who, during the immigration crisis with the Syrian refugees, right? Germany was one of the rare countries to really welcome the refugees and assimilate them, right? In a way that many countries were uncomfortable doing, right? This is this is a symptom of feminine leadership, right? This ability to be hospitable, to receive, to nurture, to care for, um, and not to be you know, on the defensive, right? Um, so you have that uh, example. In the field of medicine, you have the, the huge contributions of women um, in women's health, right? Let me give you an example of, of um, one of the huge problems with the way that um, uh, breast cancer is treated, right? So we are in a, still in a very male-dominated medical uh, field where cancer is seen kind of like an, an enemy that we have to shoot down, right? This is the war metaphor that if you are a male, this is natural, right? So there is a cancer and we're going to shoot it down with chemotherapy, with invasive uh, treatments, and then the cancer will die. So it sounds good until you are dealing with a feminine body, with a woman's body, because you shoot down the cancer, but at the same time, you destroy her fertility, right? So she can't have children anymore, right? So, so the physician who has destroyed the cancer goes home happy, satisfied, the cancer is dead. The woman, however, goes home devastated because she cannot bear fruit anymore. Right. So so these this is just an example of how if we had more, which we do now, obviously, but since the coming in of more female physicians, we have found alternative ways of treating the cancer. We have emphasized prevention when it comes to breast cancer. We have emphasized the study of the psychological um, issues that give rise to such cancers. Right. Still in the field of prevention. Right. So you have a lot being done now in order to prevent the invasive treatment, right? So that the woman doesn't have to lose that part of herself, right? So, so it's just an example, right? Of how the, the inclusion of women in the medical field has, is beginning to shift the way that we um, treat certain cancers, right? Okay, so there are countless examples, but this is just to give you an idea of how, what Irigaray means, right? When she says civilization needs both perspectives to really happen. Okay, so that's the second way. Um, yeah, something else with the second wave, which we'll see with the Rikurai, is the notion that the man is not the enemy, 
right? In first wave, the man is the enemy. He's the one that has oppressed us and we are now uh, demanding our rights. So the tone in first wave is much more aggressive right? It's much more confrontational. If you read first wave texts, if you're a man, you're going to start to, you know, feel aggressed, <laughs> right? So the tone in first wave is very much, we want our place, move over, right? You know, like, <laughs> so that's kind of the attitude. Second wave, however, is more conciliatory, right? It's the idea that let's not see man as the enemy, let's see man as a partner, with whom we must work in order to achieve equality. Right? So this is very different from first wave where man is the opponent, man is the one we confront. Second wave is the idea that we must work together, we must partner together, we need to partner together because alone we are not enough, either one of us, right? And Irigaray is one of those who really emphasizes the importance of partnership between the male and the female if we're going to really progress so she's never going to say oh females should rule the world right that's never going to come out of her mouth <laughs> right i've heard it i've heard it from others but not from her right and she of course not going to say males should rule the world but it should be a joint venture right so the, those are the two main ideas of yuri Gray, by the way you can jot down that you'll find number one the notion of um the woman's voice needing to be included in all disciplines if we're going to reach civilization and number two the the perspective on the male which is seen as a partner and not as an enemy right and and she writes a lot about how to connect how to create intimacy with males how to love uh, the other gender she has written extensively about this right because as we all know these the relationship between the male and the female is one of the most difficult challenging relationships right um, because we are so different and we don't speak the same language, uh, emotional language, right? So, so Irigaray has worked extensively to, to, uh, to, to, talk, uh, to, to, to help us learn each other's love language so we can better, uh, uh, so we can uh, weave a more intimate relationship, right? We're going to talk about this in one of the texts that we do. Okay, so third wave. Third wave is the breakdown of gender. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> so you here you have people like Butler. Uh, she's the main one. Um, Judith Butler, right? Uh, who wrote uh, Gender Trouble. <laughs> so this is a fascinating um, movement. Uh, this is, so again, it's coming from the idea that as long as um, differences exist, we have oppression. This is the same idea that we had in first wave, remember. First wave was saying, as long as we are un different, we're unequal. So third wave is gonna go back to this argument saying, as long as, we're, as long as there is any difference that exists, we are still going to be treated inferior. And so they, but they're not just hitting, um, you know, uh, the differences. So, so in a way they are. And, and so they're going to take issue with the concept of gender. Because for third wave feminists, as long as the concept of gender exists, male, female, it's going to degenerate into some kind of oppression, right? So it's not even about a concept of inferior female or superior male, right? Like first wave. First wave was saying, let's stop seeing women as, you know, X, Y, Z, and let's see women like males. But they're going to say, we need to get rid of the concept altogether of gender. Because as long as we have gender, we're going to have oppression. And so somebody like Judith Butler is going to argue um, with some difficulty, <laughs> but she's going to attempt to argue that not only uh, gender is a construct, but sexual difference. So let me explain. This is fascinating, even though it's not what we'll do with the irigra, it's interesting to know. So gender is, is uh, what it means to be masculine and feminine, right? Uh, so for example, gender, feminine. I can't write. Okay, so for example, gender, like if I'm a female gender, then we know that I will be, you know, more caring, more gentle, whatever, nurturing. A male gender is more, you know, strong and, and energetic. So this is, so gender immediately puts labels, right, on what a woman is and what a man is, right? Uh, so, so there's a huge issue with gender already. Everybody knows that, right? So first wave feminism, they say, well, gender is that we are all the same, right? Second wave feminism says, no, we have different gender, but we are equal, yet different. 
third wave is going to say, let's get rid of gender, <laughs> right? Let's not have gender, but they go further. They want to get rid even of sexual difference. And this is where it gets difficult. Um, according to Butler, and she makes an interesting argument for this, even sexual difference is a construct that at birth, we see a baby as male and female. Why? Why do we focus on this? If we didn't have the concept of sexual difference, maybe we wouldn't even notice that there is this minute difference, she says, right, between people. So this is, some, some of us will get lost on that level when she starts to argue for the sexual difference as a construct. But gender difference definitely is a construct. Gender definitely is something we have created, right, in our culture, in our mind. And, and, and we have the power to decreate it. We have the power to transform what it means to be a woman and a man. And that's what second wave feminism does. It doesn't go, it doesn't do away with gender, but it says, let's, let's re-describe what it means to be a woman, right? Let's keep gender, but let's work with it. Let's, Let's, let's add to it, let's subtract from it, let's nuance it, right? But third wave is gonna get rid of gender altogether. Now, she makes an excellent argument, to be honest, Judith Butler, because she says, well, I'm bothered by this concept of what it means to be a woman, because I don't fit into any of the categories that have been here to describe, right? Judith Butler, if you see, uh, if, if you've met her, you know that she's, um, First of all, her sexual orientation is not heterosexual. She's a lesbian. Then, second of all, she doesn't have the feminine characteristics. She dresses like a man. So when you look at somebody like she's a woman, but at the same time, she doesn't fit into what people say women should be, right? Like feminine and flowy and, <laughs> and uh, you know, romantic and emotional. She says, I don't connect with these definitions. So what does that mean? I'm not a woman, right? So she's... So she, she rightly sees the issue of trying to define what it is to be a woman. As soon as you try to define, you're going to exclude, right? And that's the danger of second wave, right? Where second wave is trying to define or redefine what it is to be a woman, many women will not feel like they fit in those categories. And so what then, right? Um, so, so that's Butler's issue, right? She, she, doesn't, she wants us to stop. Let's stop trying to define ourselves or let ourselves be defined. Let's get rid of this and let's just be human beings, <clears throat> right? Let's just be me. <laughs> so this is a very, very attractive, right, idea. Uh, the only problem with it is that if you get rid of gender, I'm worried that the same thing will happen that if you get rid of race. So let me make this argument a little bit because I, I put the two in, in, in parallel, right? There is the idea floating around that in order to get rid of racism, we should get rid of race. In other words, say there are no races. Everybody is human, right? Now, can anybody see the problem with that? As soon as we say there is no race, there's just human beings. Anybody see a problem? I mean, oh no, in a way it's liberating, but in another sense, what's the problem? Uh, so first of all, yes, Ben, you're right. There's another problem that race is disappearing because we are becoming more and more mixed, right? Korolashvili. <clears throat> so yes, first of all, if you remove the race, you remove a whole culture, a whole background, a whole history is erased. And maybe that's what some people want. If we erase the concept of race, maybe we will erase the concept of racism and the history <laughs> that we carry that we have carried in this country without ever facing, right? So, so that's a cop-out for many people. Maybe many people say this is a cop-out to say there's no race because you are erasing us even more than before, right? The, the, this idea that there is no race in a way is going to not make racism worse, but is going to continue to create an invisible uh, <clears throat> people. Right, if you've read um, Ellison's The Invisible Man, right, about being a black man in America and being, not being seen because you're black, <laughs> right? Uh, if you take away the concept of race, you have, if you have worsened the situation, right? Now, really, everybody, there's no more problems, right? There, racism doesn't exist. And this, for many people, is a cop-out, right? You can't just remove race and then proclaim that because there is no race, there is no racism, <laughs> right? So the same can be applied in, in women's studies, right? If you remove gender, you remove 
whatever force existed that could fight back against patriarchy, right? You have now completely erased the woman, which she was already doing poorly, right? So if you remove the concept of gender, you remove the weapon with which we can fight with our difference against the male-dominated society, right? If there is no more gender, then who is going to fight for what, <laughs> right? That's some of the issues with the genderless, right? In, in my view, you lose the difference, you lose the specificity, you lose the richness, but you also lose the voice, you lose the protest, you lose the revolt, right? That is contained in that race or in that gender. You lose the history, right? And, and these are things that we, it would be nice to lose, but we can't lose because we are still in the war, <laughs> right? There is still oppression going on of both Blacks and women. As long as there is oppression, we have to speak, <laughs> right? As a woman or as a Black man or woman, right? That has, those concepts have to remain healthy and strong so that the difference can be protected, the culture can be safeguarded, and the voice can be strong, right? The, the voice of, of revolt or the voice um, for justice, right? Am I making sense? Do you see the, the issue of um, uh, the importance of maintaining concepts like gender or race? And I mean, physiologically, I mean, as of right now, women are the ones that give birth. So there's still, that is, I understand the gender constructs. I do understand that. Um, but you can't erase what it is to be a woman because there are certain things that men can do and there are certain things that women can do. Right. And, and this is the part part with Butler, right? So she, I get, I follow her when she talks about gender, how we should get rid of it. I get that, but sexual difference is different. It's difficult to make that into a construct. <laughs> In my view, I'm having a hard time following her there, right? So there's still some differences, but I get her worry that as soon as you create a difference, you set the stage for oppression, right? Oh, you're different. Therefore, like Aristotle, you are inferior and weak and you need this and you need that, right? So that's, that's her issue. She's longing for, for there being no more ammunition. <laughs> so, to making her feel inferior. So she just wants to walk around neutral. <laughs> um, I mean, it's easy for a woman to do that, but for a black person, it would be a little harder to walk around neutral, right? So it's, it's, it's not something that would work, I think, to really, really uh, solve the problem of oppression. Just to reduce the difference goes back to what I said before, creates a false peace. Right, we are at peace because now we have the illusion that we are all the same. But the true peace, right, is a peace where the differences exist and yet are able to work together. Right? Okay. Uh, any other questions before uh, um, I, I finish with Irigaray? Okay. Um, <clears throat> All right, so let me say a few words about um, her work, the reading that she'll be doing. So Irigura is pretty hard for two reasons. She's very poetic, so that's good. So in a way, she's very beautiful writing, right? It's, <clears throat> it's a pleasure to read. <clears throat> in my case, when I first read Irigura, I was just mesmerized, right? She, she felt like, it felt like I was entering, how shall I say, a lost, forgotten place where I was from. It, I don't know if, if anyone can relate to what I'm saying. <clears throat> have you ever had a, um, have you ever been to a country where you feel like, yeah, I feel at home here. This is my home. I never knew it was my home. <clears throat> You've never been to that country. <clears throat> this is kind of how I felt in a rigorized writing, right? I felt like it was a homecoming, right? All of a sudden I realized, oh, wow, this is who, this is who I am, this is my language, this is my, <clears throat> my hood, <laughs> like we say here, right? Um, and so in, in, in many ways, it was a coming home for me. So for many women, when you read Irigara, you're going to resonate very deeply with what she's saying because she's saying things that we've always kind of felt but never really understood or said, she says it, right? So it's a very beautiful exploration of your own psyche as a woman. 
as a man, you're going to benefit because you will finally understand, you will finally understand what women want. <laughs> Who, what do they think? What do they desire? She really will introduce you to a woman's inner world, right? So as a man, it's a very interesting journey also to be able to understand woman from within. She really is vulnerable and exposed in the way that she writes about femininity, about women's desires, about who we are and so forth. So it's very exquisite reading for the poetic is difficult because she alludes to a lot of philosophers we haven't studied <laughs> so she's gonna allude to three contemporaries that if you haven't read them you're gonna be like what the hell is going on right so that's gonna make it a little more difficult um but try to just um let yourself be charmed by the poetry um that's already a, a, a good um <clears throat> Uh, part of her writing and again right you don't need to understand everything you just need to experience your regret so don't worry if you don't understand everything I'll clarify in class okay any last questions all right so you guys can go if some of you need to stay